Hi, I'm Tom Tobin, the healthcare sector head here at Hedgeye. I'm joined on the phone by Emily Evans out of Nashville, our healthcare policy analyst, and Paul Glempshire, our legal analyst out of Washington, D.C. They both attended the Affordable Care Act District Court uh, hearing earlier this week in New Orleans and have some opinions about uh, what we're going to see later this year in terms of a decision uh, and remaining that back to the lower courts. Uh, we have a few questions we're gonna, uh, we think the case turns on, and I'm going to ask some questions here, and we'll, we'll get, like, get some responses from, from Paul and Emily. Uh, so the case really turns on three major items. One, do the parties have standing? Uh, the meanings, uh, are they supposed to even be in the courtroom? Uh, the second is, is the individual mandate con unconstitutional? Which is basically the question that they covered uh, during the hearing. And if it is unconstitutional, uh, is it severable from the law? So let's get into it. So the first question for you, Paul and Emily, uh, whoever wants to answer this first, uh, how do you think the court will answer those questions? Why don't you take that, Paul? Okay. Um, I, I, our sense then is, is that coming out of the courtroom, that the court will probably say that they can hear the appeal. There are some procedural questions about whether the parties were properly before the appellate court. This is the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, one court level below the Supreme Court. And we think, we think they'll, they'll go ahead and make a decision in this appeal the, 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 on the standing question, which is whether the plaintiffs who asserted that the, initially asserted that the individual mandate is unconstitutional, um, they'll probably find that there's standing there, or at least that the, some of the states uh, that, that challenged the mandate would have standing as well, given budgetary impacts, et cetera. Um, so we sense they'll have standing. Um, and on the question of whether the individual mandate is, is now unconstitutional because the, 19, the 2017 tax law cut the penalty, the tax penalty, to zero, so the thinking is if it's not really a tax, and the Supreme Court said the individual mandate could be upheld as a tax uh, under the, government, the Congress's taxing power, raises nothing now, so the, the thinking is maybe it's not a tax. Our sense is that they probably will lean in that direction as well. Um, it's not a slam dunk, but, but our sense is that they seem to be leaning in favor of that. Um, and finally, the, the last big issue is on severability, and that is whether if the individual mandate goes down, the entire law, every component of the Affordable Care Act would be struck down, even if it has nothing to do with the individual mandate. Our sense is that the, although the district court, the trial court below, Judge Reed O'Connor did that, our sense is the appellate court judges, the three judges, of the, probably are uncomfortable with that. Um, they're sympathetic to the idea of doing that, and we can get into that in more detail later, but uh, our sense is that they'll probably not be comfortable going that far, and it would say that the, the trial court below should, should parse through what should stay and what should go. But before that happens, it'll probably be appealed up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, that could be a big, big case uh, you know, next year with uh, large political implications as well. All right, great. And, and from your being inside the courtroom, did you have a sense of which of those questions that they cover was sort of debated most hotly, most contested uh, between the lawyers uh, and the judges, or how the questions came down from the judges? Yeah, I think on severability, I, I think that's the issue. The, 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 the question being, you know, if the individual mandate goes down, sort of like the, the trunk of the tr Christmas tree comes down, are you going to sit around and debate what ornaments ought to stay? Um, it, that was sort of the reasoning of the lower court. And I think at least one of the judges, and he's a Trump appointee, uh, was very sympathetic to the view that, you know, when, the, when a big chunk of the law goes down like that, um, it really shouldn't be the court's business to try to pick and choose what stays. Congress should just fix it. That was sort of the, the view of the lower court. I get a sense there's sympathy to that view, for that view. I, I just don't think the judicial precedents back the court uh, being that aggressive, and, and, and uh, but they really probed into that. They really started digging into the severability question. So that suggests that that that's uh, that's the most contentious issue, and uh, likely one that's going to you know breed additional litigation. Right. So they're they're not going to want to sever it. They're not. Severability is it, it can be severed and keep the law. I think, the, I think they're going to ask them to sort through. Yeah, I, I think what, the, what they're going to say is that Judge O'Connor made a mistake by saying that the entire law has to be struck down, everything, okay. uh, including things having nothing to, really to do with, uh, not really intertwined with the individual mandate. 
Um, and, and a lot of that is it's a rising trend, and it's a big issue. It's it, along among a lot of uh, conservative judges is that you know maybe the, the courts are overstepping when they're asked to rescue statutes when key provisions are struck down as unconstitutional. That absent a specific provision of the law that says if this is struck down, everything stays the same. If Congress doesn't clearly say that. Then you get into a question is, is judges really wonder whether they should be in the business of picking and choosing what parts of the law can act and operate independently without the provision that gets struck down. And increasingly, you had four justices on the U.S. Supreme Court in the NFIB case in 2012 who said it's not our job to do that. And those four dissenters in that case would have struck the whole law down just like Judge O'Connor did. Um, but I, I don't think the appellate court in the Fifth Circuit has that flexibility. So I don't think they're going to do that here. But what could happen is, is after they make their decision, including severability, this thing could get appealed to the Supreme Court. And I think the debate then, and much of the press will focus on, well, now that we're at the Supreme Court, will it be five justices who might say, if they find the individual mandate unconstitutional, could there be five, a majority now that would say, you know, strike the whole thing down. Mm. It's not our business to pick and choose what stays. That could be a big issue that the Supreme Court could address, and 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 uh, that could happen as early as next year. All right. And Emily, did you yeah, have was, did you have any comment on that in terms of what was yeah. a contentious question in the room and and how you how you read it? Yeah, and um, Paul uh, Paul Paul covered it, but uh, it, it was there, it was probably the most dramatic part of the day when the Trump appointment appointee uh, Judge Engelhart. Uh, says to the representative, uh, the, the attorney for the House of Representatives, he says, why are you always asking the judiciary to come and perform taxidermy on Congress's big game legislation? If you want to fix this, the House could do, you could do this tomorrow. You, you could, the House and, and, and the, the House of Representatives attorney responds with, well, yeah, but the, but Trump wouldn't, wouldn't sign it. Um, which you know wasn't wasn't exactly the the, the point. Someone beside the point, actually. Um, but uh, and then the 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 the, the battle that I think is going to ensue in the in the panel uh, is going to be between a more moderate judge Judge Elrod, uh, who was appointed by Bush, who says at one point, look, we when we when we have issues like this, we send them down to the district court and let them figure out what should stay and what should go. Why shouldn't we do that here? Um, and and so you can see that's going to be the that's going to be the the, the discussion that, uh, that is going to be had in in the in the judges chambers about what how they're going to handle that and 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 what the trade offs are for 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 reaching that decision. Uh, Elrod. You know, what wants is wants to find the individual mandate unconstitutional, but isn't going to do it necessarily on terms that are so uh, draconian, like throwing out uh, the entire law. Okay, so you, that was my so opinion. seeing this as you know, as it goes back down to the lower court, and I, this is mainly for Emily, is is what do you think stays and what goes if if that's the path that they they take this down. Um, so, if it gets back to the district court, and that's assuming either the Supreme Court doesn't take it up, or the uh, Supreme Court takes it up and and uh, agrees with the the appellate court uh, on all issues, if it gets back that there, then what I would ex I think there's a really reasonable argument to be made uh, that. All of Title I is dependent on the individual mandate. And Title I is the part of the Affordable Care Act that covers things like um, uh, the pre existing, what we call pre existing conditions, uh, guaranteed issue is, is the formal name, um, the, the provisions that set the central health benefits for. Uh, for individual uh, insurance, the provisions that require certain preventive uh, services to be covered, even by uh, ERISA plans and and large large group plans. Um, you know the the things when you think of the Affordable Care Act, you're thinking of the things in in Title One. Now, if you com uh, the things that probably 
wouldn't make sense to exclude or sever uh, would be a, a ton of feel-good provisions about uh, rural health, things really that would pass the Congress today. Um, rural health, the CMMI, the, the Innovation Center at, at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, would would likely uh, would likely stay. Interestingly, I think there's a really good argument to be made that Medicaid expansion uh, should also be uh, be retained along with the Medicare provisions. The Medicaid expansion is in a separate section of the law. It really kind of stands on its own, separate from the individual mandate. Or, and if the, there is a relationship, it is it is somewhat tenuous. The last part that I think you could make a decent argument should be excluded would be the section Title IX, which covers all of the taxes and the revenue-raising items that that support the the cost sh- the the uh, premium subsidies that the IRS uh, gives purchasers of insurance, and that's things like the medical device tax, a tax um, somewhat bizarrely on tanning services, um, the big $14, $15 billion a year tax on health insu- on, on all insurance uh, that's underwritten in the United States. And then finally, and most controversially, a Cadillac tax, which is a 40% excise tax on high benefit plans, which is going to hit in 2021 and, ha- and be very difficult for uh, governments, local, go- local and state governments, which tend to offer very rich benefit plans uh, to, to sustain. So I, I think that that's our reading of it, right. you know, based on the, the question. So title, title One stays or goes? I think Title One goes. Title One goes. And then the Medicaid expansion stays or goes? Stays. Stays. And then the, the taxes stay or go? Uh, jump ball. Jump ball. Okay. So anything to do with the individual market then, as it relates to this mandate, those that, that system goes away. And do you think those folks then you know, that the, that the insurance market will just sort of you know, resuscitate the old individual market practices overnight, and then we end up moving back pretty quickly probably from the, what are there, 10, 12 million people on the individual market at this point, that the, they revert oh. into you know, old, old business practices, the individual market reconstitutes? Yeah. I think it's really unlikely that the, there's any going back here. Uh, the Affordable Care Act so disrupted uh, the industry. I, I don't see that as likely. Uh, what is, the possibilities are, uh, Congress acts. Um, there are provisions in Title I that are generally supported by both parties, things like pro, you know, the guarantee issue, um, the keeping your kids on your insurance until 26, um, those are the things that, that most people are, are pretty comfortable with. Uh, what probably would be difficult to get through Congress is the community rating and the age bands. You know, in the, under the Affordable Care Act, an insurer can't charge an older person more than three times a, a younger person. That, that's pretty controversial. So, so there's a couple of things that could possibly get through Congress and get rescued uh, with some of the more difficult things uh, going by by the wayside. Uh, essential health benefits is another thing that could get revived by Congress, although that is slightly mm-hmm. controversial and not particularly good uh, policy as well. Okay. And, and Paul, could, we, could, we, could you just walk us through what the next steps and the timing and how this plays out in, in you know, the, the, big, the big chunks of time that we have you know, into you know, what the appeals court does, how that gets to the Supreme Court, and how that relates to the 2020 election? Sure. Um, it's on an expedited basis, even though the law, uh, the, the court's mandate from the lower court has stayed, so the law is still being enforced. Um, but it's still on an expedited basis. So we could get an argument, uh, I get a, I'm sorry, a decision, say, October, November. Um, it's, it's guesswork, but, but that would seem a reasonable time frame for decision. You could have multiple opinions here, and of course they all have to circulate and be voted on by the judges, and that takes additional time. Um, and of course you're going into the summer months and that can slow some things down and there's clerk turnover probably happening too, judicial clerk turnover. So all that can have an effect on how quickly they can move. But let's say reasonably sometime October, November you get a decision. 
then the question becomes, does it go straight to the Supreme Court from there, or does is there some sort of an intervening, what they call an on-bank, full Fifth Circuit, all the active judges uh, review? Um, I would think that it, it may be something that the Democratic appointees would want to move quickly to the Supreme Court, because if you get a decision uh, late this year, there's still an outside chance you could put it on the next uh, terms docket at the Supreme Court, where if uh, you know they decide to hear it, they'll say the four liberals on the court vote to hear it, and it takes four votes to take a case at the Supreme Court, then you could be on the docket uh, for argument decision of roughly a year from now. And that would be right in the heat of the 2020 election. Now, if it drags out, if it's one of these things where between the Fifth Circuit process and how the Supreme Court administers the, the, the petitions for review, it drags out into early next year, uh, it could be harder to put it on the docket. You'd be past the general election of 2020 before this case would be heard at the Supreme Court or certainly decided by them. So that's the thing to watch. How, how does the timing play out between the Fifth Circuit uh, decision process, uh, potential on bank, and then at the Supreme Court? Um, the procedural uh, issues with that, how quickly they can resolve them all, will determine whether it's a, a big 2020 issue or not. Who makes the decision to appeal to the, take it to the Supreme Court? Is that the lower court makes that petition? No, it, it, it's made by the parties who are disgruntled by the decision okay. of the Fifth Circuit. So and the, play, the, the plaintiff decision. in this case would, would, would appeal. And, did they're, losing. and are they incentivized to make that appeal? I think they probably are. I think, I think they are. Uh, and the other thing, too, is when you have a case like this that raises a lot of interesting legal doctrinal issues, like the issue of, of, of what is a federal court's responsibility to do a comprehensive severability analysis mm -hmm. when a big court provision gets struck, big philosophical issues like that, there'll be some people pushing to get that before the court because it could have be a precedent that, that is uh, useful in a lot of other cases. So I, I think this is the kind of thing where um, you'll, you'll see a, a lot of people with different agendas uh, wanting this case to go up. Okay. And Emily, what do you do? You have any? I mean, we, we've talked about this a lot, but what what are your sort of top down, high level impact on the healthcare subsector? Well, you know, I think that the the impact is not going to be as bad as I, the market would the market reaction might might suggest. Um, for one, because I think when all is said and done, only that Title One. Uh, gets severed out, and maybe the taxes in, in Title IX, um, the Medicaid expansion staying, which was really the most successful part of the law, uh, when you when you boil it in terms of you know getting people covered, which was the goal of the law. Uh, so so I think that the 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 the, the impact is going to be somewhat muted. Uh, so the sectors that I would be concerned about. And um, are are any any provider in the preventive services uh, role? You know anybody who's like we've talked about exact sciences, which has the colorectal uh, screening test, which has been and they're the beneficiary of it being a a uh, service that is required to be covered without any cost sharing whatsoever, and required to be covered even in in the employer market, not just uh, the individual market. So I think those types of services, goods and services, uh, are are going to be would be negatively uh, impacted. Um, the individual uh, insurers, uh, Centene, uh, certainly made uh, a big business out of the exchanges and, and actually been reasonably Reasonably successful, uh, but if you look at uh, United Health, that's not the case. They have very little exposure on uh, on that on those guys. So managed care, generally, but you've got to look down at each of the the companies to see what uh, what their exposure there. Uh, the providers, like the the big, uh, you know, like Tenant and HCA, you know, they have been the beneficiaries of you know lower bad debt. Uh, but largely, I suspect, due to the Medicaid expansion than due to the individual individual market. There's just simply not that much exposure. I think a potentially really big loser is uh, DaVita uh, and hmm. other providers that, that get um, – 
that benefit from uh, commercial insurance and the disparity between, you know, Medicare reimbursement and, and commercial insurance. I think there's a little bit of that going on with some of the behavioral health uh, providers as, as well. Uh, and in DeVita's case, it's, it's, got, it's really raised its profile, um, and we've talked about it a lot, where DeVita is providing the premium support uh, for people to purchase uh, exchange plans under the ACA and then getting covered for dialysis services at, you know, 3X, 4X, maybe even more uh, than what they would get through Medicare. Okay. And then uh, just a few questions here from subscribers. Yeah, well, this one's for you, Paul. So won't, won't the SCOTUS just overturn and keep the law? You mean if the Fifth Circuit strikes down the individual mandate uh, with the Supreme Court yeah. then restore it by ruling it is constitutional? Yes. Well, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a hard call. Um, you know, the, the court didn't spend a lot of time, uh, you know, on Tuesday on, on the issue of uh, some of the substantive issues that were raised in the briefs on how you could actually defend the constitutionality of it, even with zero tax penalty, um, not raising any revenue. Um, it's it's possible. It's possible you could uh, go back to the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Roberts says, you know what, it's it's still enough like a tax that we could continue to call it uh, an exercise of congressional taxing power. That is not impossible. The court didn't go much in depth on the substance of that issue actually at, at the uh, hearing on Tuesday, but that, that it could be a close call at the court. But on the other hand, you know, it would be hotly litigated. It'd be a five-four decision. Uh, one way or the other, most likely, and uh, too hard to know whether they would actually um, come back and say it's still a legitimate exercise of the taxing power, um, and, and then you would have to run to do the you, severability. Do you issue think, uh, do you think Judge Ro Chief Justice Roberts wants this case back at the Supreme Court? I doubt it. I really doubt it. Um, a lot of it is the timing. Um, you know, a lot of speculation that you know he didn't want to take the law down. Um, and make the Supreme Court the issue in 2012. Um, and you get a question here where it's, it's deja vu, and is he going to let the law go down and make the court a big issue in 2020? Now, that, that's why the timing's important. Um, you know, we're all speculating about, you know, motives and drivers here, but if this thing is, is not on the Supreme Court's docket until, you know, for decision until well after the 2020 election, well, then perhaps the idea of the court being the issue is less of an issue. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. you know, that, that's, that's one way to think about it. All right. Um, and if it did, I mean, I guess Emily and Paul, like, do you guys have any sense if it does make it back to the Supreme Court before the election, we get some decision one way or the other, like what, what those two, two decision trees, any impact you think? Would it energize Democrat? Like what's the political fallout from, from those options? You know, ending up. Well, I, I, yeah. I think the danger here is that the uh, that the Supreme Court becomes uh, a political issue, much like it did in 1937 when Franklin Roosevelt you know, dismayed over uh, the loss of a number of uh, New Deal bills that he had, had gotten passed. Um, they were they were rendered um, unconstitutional by the court, and his response to that is to, you know, change the composition of the court if they're over, over 60 uh, or, or something to that effect. Uh, so you've already seen a, a proposal like there should be term limits for justices. Um, you know, I think there's been even some discussion if if, if a Democrat takes the, uh, the the White House, expanding the number of justices, a la uh, Franklin uh, Roosevelt. Uh, so you you put you you, you could very very easily see where the Supreme Court becomes an issue if they take up the. Um, the law in they ha or they have to take up the law uh, right around the time of the of the the 2020 uh, election, uh, which you know doesn't which which argues for everybody slow walking it as much as possible, uh, not because there's any willful interest in one outcome or another, but because there is a shared view that the courts. Uh, the, the, the status of the Supreme Court and even the appeals court need need to be uh, need to be preserved. Okay. Um, 
Well, I th uh, Paul, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, mean, I agree with that. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, making the court the issue. It's an issue in every election. But I think this case, uh, with health care being, you know, potentially an issue of vulnerability for the Trump administration going into that election, um, and the court itself, and, 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 and against a backdrop where you really haven't seen so much of an emphasis on, on sort of these legal type of issues, antitrust and big tech and healthcare and how all of this is affected by our, our judicial and, uh, you know, the, the legal precedents that, that govern us. I mean, it, uh, it's kind of extraordinary that all of this kind of stuff is, is taking a, a, a sort of a front burner um, uh, impact in the upcoming election. So the, to me, this would just, just be another part of that. And healthcare is such a volatile issue uh, going into 2020 that, um, yeah, I, I think I think it could be really, really important here. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of very keen emotion uh, around that issue for sure, uh, and for good reason. Uh, well, thank you both, Emily and Paul, uh, for taking the time to to walk us through this court case and, and attending the court. It sounded like a really interesting event, and uh, and thanks for sharing your views with us.